men without bones. We were loading bananas into the Claire Dodge at Puerto Pobre when a feverish little fellow came aboard. Everyone stepped aside to let him pass, even the soldiers who guard the port with nickel-plated Remington rifles and who go barefoot but wear polished leather leggings. They stood back from him because they believed that he was afflicted of God, mad, harmless but dangerous, best left alone. All the time the naphtha flares were hissing and from the hold came the reverberation of the roaring voice of the foreman of the gang down below crying, Fruta, Fruta, Fruta. The leader of the dock gang bellowed the same cry, throwing down stem after stem of brilliant green bananas. The occasion would be memorable for this, if for nothing else. The magnificence of the night, the bronze of the negro foreman shining under the flares, the jade green of that fruit, and the mixed odors of the waterfront. Out of one stem of bananas ran a hairy gray spider, which frightened the crew and broke the banana chain until a Nicaraguan boy, with a laugh, killed it with his foot. It was harmless, he said. It was about then that the madman came aboard, unhindered, and asked, Bound for where? He spoke quietly and in a carefully modulated voice, but there was a certain blank, lost look in his eyes that suggested to me that I keep within ducking distance of his restless hands, which, now that I think of them, put me in mind of the gray, hairy, bird-eating spider. Mobile, Alabama, I said. Take me along? None of my affair. Sorry. Passenger myself, he said. The skipper's ashore. Better wait for him on the wharf. He's the boss. Would you happen, by chance, to have a drink about you? Giving him some rum, I asked. How come they let you aboard? I'm not crazy, he said. Not actually. A little fever, nothing more. Malaria, dung fever, jungle fever, rat bite fever. Feverish country this and others of the same nature. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Goodbody, Doctor of Science of Asbalden University. Does it convey nothing to you? No. Well then, I was assistant to Professor Yeward. Does that convey anything to you? I said, Yeward? Professor Yeward? Yes, he was lost somewhere in the upland jungle beyond the source of the Amer River. Correct! cried the little man who called himself Goodbody. I saw him get lost. Fruta, Fruta. Fruta, Fruta, came the voices of the men in the hold. There was a rivalry between their leader and the big black stevedore ashore. The flare sputtered, the green bananas came down, and a kind of sickly sigh came out of the jungle, off the rotting river, not a wind, not a breeze, something like the foul breath of high fever. Trembling with eagerness and at the same time shaking with fever chills, so that he had to use two hands to raise his glass to his lips. Even so, he spilled most of the rum, Dr. Goodbody said. For God's sake, get me out of this country. Take me to Mobile. Hide me in your cabin. I have no authority, I said. But you are an American citizen. You can identify yourself. The consul will send you home. No doubt, but that would take time. The consul thinks I am crazy too. And if I didn't get away, I, I fear that I really will go out of my mind. Can't you help me? I'm afraid. Come on now, I said. No one shall hurt you while I'm around. What are you afraid of? Men without bones, he said. And there was something in his voice that stirred the hairs in the back of my neck. Little fat men without bones. I wrapped him in a blanket and gave him some quinine, let him sweat and shiver for a while before I asked, humoring him. What men without bones? He talked in fits and starts in his fever, his reason staggering just this side of delirium. What men without bones? They have nothing to be afraid of, actually. It is they who are afraid of you. You can kill them with your boot or with a stick. They are something like jelly. No, it is not really fear. It is the nausea, the disgust they inspire. It overwhelms, it paralyzes. I've seen a jaguar. I tell you, a full-grown jaguar stand frozen while they clung to him in hundreds and ate him up alive. Believe me, I saw it. Perhaps it is 
some oil they secrete, some odor they give out. I don't know. Then, weeping Dr. Goodbody said, Oh, nightmare. Nightmare, nightmare! To think of the depths to which a noble creature can be degraded by hunger. Horrible, horrible. Some debased form of life that you found in the jungle above the source of the Amer? I suggested some degenerate kind of anthropoid. No, no, no. Men. Now surely remember Professor Yeward's ethnological expedition. Yeah, it was lost, I said. All but me, he said. We had bad luck. At the Anyanya Rapids, we lost two canoes, half of our supplies, and most of our instruments. And also Dr. Terry and Jack Lambert, and eight of our carriers. Then we were in Ahu territory, where the Indians use poison darts. But we made friends with them and bribed them to carry our stuff westward through the jungle. Because, you see, all science starts with a guess, a rumor, an old wives' tale. And the object of Professor Yearwood's expedition was to investigate a series of Indian folk tales that tallied. Legends of a race of gods that came down from the sky in a great flame when the world was very young. Line by crisscross line and circle by concentric circle, Yeward localized the place in which these tales had their root, an unexplored place that has no name because the Indians refused to give it a name, it being what they call a bad place. His chill subsiding and his fever abating, Dr. Goodbody spoke calmly and rationally now. He said with a short laugh, I don't know why. Whenever I get a touch of fever, the memory of those boneless men comes back in a nightmare to give me the horrors. So we went to look for the place where the gods came down and flame out of the night. The little tattooed Indians took us to the edge of the Ahu territory and then put down their packs and asked for their pay. And no consideration would induce them to go further. We were going, they said, to a very bad place. Their chief, who had been a great man in his day, signed writing with a twig told us that he had strayed there once and drew a picture of something with an oval body and four limbs, at which he spat before rubbing it out with his foot in the dirt. Spiders, we asked. Crabs. But, so we were forced to leave what we could not carry with the old chief against our return and go unaccompanied, Yeward and I, through 30 miles of the rottenest jungle in the world. We made about a quarter of a mile in the day. A pestilential place. When that stinking wind blows out of the jungle, I smell nothing but death and panic. But at last, we cut our way to the plateau and climbed the slope, and there we saw something marvelous. It was something that had been a great, gigantic machine. Originally, it must have been a pear-shaped thing, at least a thousand feet long, and in its widest part, six hundred feet in diameter. I don't know of what metal it had been made of because there was only a dusty outline of a hull and certain ghostly remains of unbelievably intricate mechanisms to prove that it had ever been. We could not guess from where it had come, but the impact of its landing had made a great valley in the metal of the Pato. It was the discovery of the age. It proved that countless ages ago, this planet had been visited by people from the stars. Wild with excitement, Yeward and I plunged into this fabulous ruin, but whatever we touched, fell away to fine powder. And at last, on the third day, Yearwood found a semicircular plate of some extraordinary hard metal, which was covered with the most maddeningly familiar diagrams. We cleaned it, and for 24 hours, scarcely pausing to eat and drink, Yearwood studied it. And then, before the dawn of the fifth day, he awoke me with a great cry and said, it's a map, a map of the heavens, and a chart of a course from Mars to Earth. And he showed me how those ancient explorers of space had proceeded from Mars to Earth via the moon. To crash on this naked plateau in this green hell of a jungle? I wondered. Ah, but was it a jungle then, said Yewe? This may have happened five million years ago. I said, oh, but surely it took only a few hundred years to bury Rome. How could this thing have stayed above ground for five thousand years, let alone five million? Yewe said, it didn't. The earth swallows things and regurgitates them. This is a volcanic region. One little upheaval can swallow a city, and one tiny peristalsis in the bowels of the earth can bring its remains to light again a million years later. So it must have been with the machine from Mars. I wonder who was inside it, 
he said. Yeawood replied, very likely some utterly alien creatures that couldn't tolerate the earth and died or else were killed in the crash. No skeleton could go survive such a space of time. So we built up the fire and Yeward went to sleep. Having slept, I watched. Watched for what? I didn't know. Jaguars, peccaries, snakes. None of those beasts climbed up to the plateau. There was nothing for them up there. Still, unaccountably, I was afraid. There was the weight of the ages on the place. Respect old age, one is told. The greater the age, the deeper the respect, you might say. But it is not respect, it is dread. It is fear of time and death, sir. I must have dozed because the fire was burning low. I had been most careful to keep it alive and bright when I caught my first glimpse of the boneless men. Starting up, I saw at the rim of the plateau a pair of eyes that picked up luminosity from the fading light of the fire. A jaguar, I thought, and took up my rifle. But it could not have been a jaguar, because when I looked left and right, I saw the plateau was ringed with a pair of shining eyes. As it might be, a collar of opals, and there came to my nostrils an odor of God knows what. Fear has its smell, as any animal trainer will tell you. Sickness has its smell, ask any nurse. These smells compel healthy animals to fight or to run away. This was a combination of the two, plus a stink of vegetation gone bad. I fired at the pair of eyes I'd first seen, and all the eyes disappeared, while from the jungle came a chattering and a twittering of monkeys and birds as the echoes of the shot went flapping away. And then, thank God, the dawn came. I should not have liked to see by artificial light the thing I had shot between the eyes. It was gray and in texture tough and gelatinous. Yet in form, externally, it was not unlike a human being. It had eyes, and there were either vestiges or rudiments of head and neck and a kind of limbs. He ever told me that I must pull myself together, overcome my childish revulsion, as he called it, and look into the nature of the beast. I may say that he kept a long way away from it when I opened it. It was my job as a zoologist of the expedition, and I had to do it. Microscopes and other delicate instruments had been lost with the canoes. I worked with a knife and forceps and found nothing a kind of digestive system enclosed in a very tough jelly, a rudimentary nervous system, and a brain about the size of a walnut. The entire creature stretched out, measured four feet. In a laboratory, I could tell you perhaps something about it, with an assistant or two to keep me company. As it was, I did what I could with a hunting knife and forceps, without dyes or microscopes swallowing my nausea. It was a nauseating thing, memorizing what I found. But as the sun rose higher, the thing liquefied, melted. Until nine o'clock, there was nothing but a gluttonous gray puddle with two green eyes swimming in it. The eyes, I can see them now, burst with a thick pop, making a detestable sticky ripple in that puddle of corruption. After that, I went away for a while. When I came back, the sun had burned it all away, and there was nothing but something like what you see after a dead jellyfish has evaporated on a hot beach. Slime. Hayward had a white face when he asked me. What the devil is it? I told him that I didn't know, that it was something outside my experience, and that although I pretended to be a man of science with a detached mind, nothing would induce me ever to touch one of those things again. Hayward said, you're getting hysterical, good body. Adopt the proper attitude. God knows we are not here for the good of our health. Science, man, science. Not a day passes, but some doctor pokes his finger into fouler things than that. I said, don't you believe it, Professor Yeward. I've handled and dissected some pretty queer things in my life, but this is something repulsive. I have nerves, I dare say. Maybe we should have brought a psychiatrist. I notice, by the way, you aren't too anxious to come close to me after I've tampered with that thing. 
will shoot one with pleasure, but if you want to investigate it, try it yourself and see. Yeward said that he was deeply occupied with his metal plate. There was no doubt, he told me, that this machine that had been had come from Mars, but evidently he preferred to keep the fire between himself and me after I had touched that abomination of hard jelly. Yearwood kept to himself, rummaging in the ruin. I went about my business, which was to investigate forms of animal life. I do not know what I might have found if I had. I don't say the courage, because I didn't lack that if I had some company. Alone, my nerve broke. It happened one morning. I went into the jungle that surrounded us, trying to swallow the fear that choked me and drive away the sense of revulsion that not only made me want to turn and run, but made me afraid to turn my back, even to get away. You may or may not know that all of the beasts that live in the jungle, the most impregnable is the sloth. He finds a stout limb, climbs out on it, hangs from it by twelve steely claws, the tardigrade that lives on the leaves. Your tardigrade is so tenacious that even in death, shot through the heart, it will hang on to its branch. It has an immensely tough hide covered by an impenetrable coat of coarse, matted hair. The panther or a jaguar is helpless against the passive resistance of such a creature. It finds itself a tree, which it does not leave until it has eaten every leaf and chooses for a sleeping place a branch exactly strong enough to bear its weight. In this detestable jungle, one of my brief expeditions, brief, because I was alone and afraid, I stopped to watch a giant sloth hanging motionless from the largest bough of a half denuded tree, asleep, impervious, indifferent. Then out of that stinking green twilight came a horde of those jellyfish things. They poured up the tree and writhed along the branch. Even the sloth, which generally knows no fear, was afraid. It tried to run away, hooked itself onto a thinner part of the branch, which broke. It fell, and at once was covered with a shuddering mass of jelly. Those boneless men do not bite, they suck. As they suck, their color changes from gray to pink, and then to brown. They are afraid of us. There is a race memory involved here. We repel them, they repel us. They became aware of my presence. They, I was going to say, ran away. <laughs> they slid away, dissolved into the shadows that kept dancing and dancing and dancing under the trees. And the horror came upon me, so that I ran away and arrived back at our camp, bloody about the face with thorns and utterly exhausted. Yeward was lancing a place in his ankle. A tourniquet was tied under his knee. Nearby lay a dead snake. He had broken its back with the same metal plate, but it had bitten him first. He said, what kind of a snake do you call this? I'm afraid it is venomous. I feel a numbness in my cheeks and around my heart, and I cannot feel my hands. I said, oh my god, you've been bitten by a yariaka. And we have lost our medical supplies, he said with regret. And there is so much work left to do. Oh, dear me, dear me. Whatever happens, my dear fellow, take this and get back. He gave me that semicircle of unknown metal as a sacred trust. Two hours later, he died. That night, the circle of glowing eyes grew narrower. I emptied my rifle at it time and again. At dawn, the boneless men disappeared. I heaped rocks on the body of Yeward. I made a pylon so that the men without bones could not get at him. Then, oh, I was so dreadfully lonely and afraid. I shouldered my pack and took my rifle and my machete ran away down the trail we had covered, but I lost my way. Can by can of food I shed weight, and my rifle went in my ammunition. After that I threw away even my machete. A long time later, that semicircular plate became too heavy for me, so I tied it to a tree with the yana vine and went on. So I reached the Ahu territory tattooed men nursed me and were kind to me. 
The women chewed my food for me before they fed me until I was strong again. But the stores we had left there I took only as much as I might need, leaving the rest as payment for guides and men to man the canoe down the river. And so I got back out of the jungle. Please give me a little more rum. His hand was steady now as he drank, and his eyes were clear. I said to him, Assuming that what you say is true, these boneless men they were, I presume, the Martians? Yet it sounds unlikely. Surely do invertebrates smelt hard metals and... Who said anything about Martians? Cried Dr. Goodbody. No, no. Martians came here, adapted themselves to new conditions of life. Poor fellows. They changed, sank low. Went through a whole new process, a painful process of evolution. What I'm trying to tell you is that Yeward and I did not discover Martians. Idiot. Don't you see? Those boneless things are men. We are Martians. <laughs> 